Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. I wanted to do another study. Uh, courageous man, foolish man. We haven't done one in a while. I'm a King James Bible believer, so make sure you have your King James Bibles out and following along. Uh, we're going to do Numbers 13, chapter 13 and 14. So turn to Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Right. Get into context of what's going on. So throw this out there real quick. Before this, the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that there would be land, physical land, for the Jews. And what they're doing here is Moses is sending people out to spy the land that God promised them, and God said he would give it to them. Numbers 13, 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them, and Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Haran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. How many tribes were in the children of Israel? Twelve. Which is why this is called twelve spies. And these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shamu, the son of Zakur, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Korai, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunim, of the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshiah, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Haltai, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadil, the son of Sodai, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Shushai, of the tribe of Dan, Amenel, the son of Gamaliel, Gamaliel, of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabai, the son of Phashai, of the tribe of Gad, Hugh, the son of Mattai. These are the names of them which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshiah, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Now I want to stop there for a second. Notice how Jehoshua is spelled differently than Joshua. People say jo Joshua and Caleb were both there. But as we read, I mean, if you want to put in the comments what you think, part of you wants to believe that Caleb was, I mean, Caleb was there, but Joshua was not one of the 12 spies. But right here it says, Osh Moses called Oshea, which was one of the 12, the son of Nun, Josiah. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountains. But then again, Joshua is the head of one of the 12 tribes. So, okay. all those men were the heads of the children of Israel. So, you know, uh, I just wonder if you guys know, brothers and sisters Christ, why it's spelled differently here and then further down in the book of Joshua, it's spelled differently than Jehoshua. Okay. So Moses sent them, verse 17, to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountains and see the land what it is and the people that dwell therein whether they be strong or weak few or many and what the land is that they dwell in whether it be good or bad and what city they be that dwell, they dwell in whether in tents or in strongholds and what the land is whether it be fat or lean whether there be wood therein or not and be ye of good courage and bring out bring of the fruit of the land now the time was the now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes so they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zen unto Rehob Rehob as men come to Hamath and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron where Hamai Tishai and Talmai Talmai butchering that the children of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Okay. So I wanted to get this down. Twelve people are being sent out, all from the heads of the twelve tribes. Numbers 13, 23. We're going to continue. We're going to get into courageous men or foolish men. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs, and took two of them, 
to bear it on the staff. Okay. Huge clump of grapes. And some people say grapes back then were bigger than the grapes we have today. The place was called the Brook of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Now they were there for 40 days. Is there a relationship between the 40 days and God punishing Israel for all those who doubted they could get the land and tell them they had to wander for 40 years? I don't know. I think there is. Verse 27, and they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now this part, Numbers 13, 23 through 27, it's positive. It's a positive report. It's amazing. This land is great. Everything in it is great. Okay. Exactly as the Lord promised. Now let's see the other side of the report. Numbers 13, 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Okay. They're showing how the people are great. Cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Madnite there. Um, they're showing that the people were looked pretty strong and foreboding. Okay? That's negative. And I hate going off on a tan uh, on a tangent a little bit. It's kind of like the gospel today. People get told that there's a way to go to heaven. You can live forever uh, in paradise. You know, all these false religions. You can live in paradise. You can live forever. But even with professing Christians today, you can live forever. You know, indestructible body. You never have to hunger, thirst, anything. You get to go to heaven. That's positive. But then they get told they have to repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and call upon the name of the Lord to save them. And afterwards, God purchases you. He tells you what to do. He cleans up your life. There's a changed life. They have to let go of this world. They have to go from being carnally minded, walking after the flesh, to being spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. And to those of us who are saved, that's very positive. But to the lost world, that's negative. They like the positive, but they don't like the negative. They don't want to let go of this world. But here we're seeing two different or two parts of the report. What the land is, as far as the fruits of the land, and then the people in the land. You see me looking a lot, I'm checking out Victoria, make sure she's okay. Now, I think I went too far. Okay. Numbers 1330, we've heard both, both parts of the report. Now let's see what the 12 spies say. One of them says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are able to overcome it. That's key, the way he words it. But the men that went up with him, that's why I'm like, did Joe, is it a different person or is it Joshua? Because it says here, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now look at the words that they chose. Stronger than we. What did Caleb say? We are able to overcome it. Caleb was one of the twelve that actually saw what they were up against. God said they could go up and possess the land that I, that they, that God promised them. Caleb believed God's word. Also, notice that Caleb said we are able to overcome it, while the other said we are stronger than we. Why is that important? The difference what Caleb said and what the other eleven people said. The other, but the men that went up with him. That's the other eleven said, we are not able to go up against them for they're too strong. If Joshua went with them, that would include Joshua, right? So I'd like to know your thoughts on that. But why is those words important? 1 John 4, 4. 
Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan. Okay? God said they could take it. Greater is God than these men. That's why Caleb said we're able to overcome these men. We can overcome them. Why? Because greater is God. The other people were looking at men's strength, our own strength. We're not strong enough to go up against them. Okay? 2 Corinthians 2.10 For us, brothers and sisters in Christ, when are we the most strongest? That's just a good question. When are we the strongest? Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. When we fall flat on our face because we try to rely on our own strength and we actually, you know, we become weak, obviously weak, we're always weak, it's only God's strength that gets me through each day, but obviously we can see it, we're weak, then God can be strong in us. Okay. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Okay. Jesus is our strength. We're able what is it? We can overcome them because greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. Jesus is our strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, what is God's attitude towards men's strength versus his strength? 1 Corinthians 1.23 But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Okay, what we're looking here is there's two things going on. God's strength, God's word, versus men's strength and men's word. Okay. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men. No matter how foolish this world thinks God is, it's almost like he's being a little sarcastic in the sense that no matter how wise, the wisest, wisest, wisest man on earth is still foolishness with God. Okay? And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay? The strongest man on this earth is foolishness to God. Okay. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, remember David, King David, when he numbered Israel. Uh, there was times where they went out to battle, and yeah, they had to number people to say, go here, go there. Or God said, only take 3,000, then he said, only take 300. You know, there's that. But what happened was, King David wasn't at war, wasn't going out to battle or nothing. He wanted to see the physical strength of men of Israel and he numbered Israel he wasn't relying on the strength of God okay? that's why he got in trouble and that's why he was punished okay? two things they're going to attack your belief in the word of God first John 4 4 in your life brothers and sisters in Christ Caleb said we can do it the other 11 said no we can't do it they were attacking in a way, they were saying Caleb was wrong, or they were, they were saying Caleb's wrong and God's wrong. So they're going to attack your belief in the Word of God. 1 John 4, 4, Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We just talked about that one. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Stick to the God's Word. Stand, stand, stand. Don't let anybody get you to back down on the true gospel, the major doctrine, the Bible version issue. Okay? Uh, verse, uh, First Peter 5, 8. Okay? Now, God warns us. There's an old song, uh, as I'm looking at some of these songs, but this was a song back in the day that was pretty, you know, kind of contemporary music, and it was, uh, Praise the Lord, Hallelujah, I don't care what the devil's going to do. Okay. Well, when someone says that, what does the Bible say? Okay. The devil, when it talks about the sower and the seeds, where he's sowing the seeds, that the devil comes and snatches the word up. Okay. We're warned about the, uh, Satan's tactics. We're warned about wolves in sheep's clothing. We're warned about false converts. Okay. We're warned 
about the way of this world. We're warned about our flesh, the nature of our flesh. So 1 Peter 5, 8, what are we told when it comes to Satan? Are we told who cares what Satan does? I don't care what the devil's going to do. You don't have to fear him. But you have the attitude, who cares? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We're told to be sober and to be vigilant. We're supposed to keep our guard up. God is our strength. He tells us. He warns us. Stay away from that. Stay away from Him. Stay away from them. They're not truly saved. Stay away from the lost world. You have to fellowship with the lost world. You can help neighbors out. You can spend time with family and whatnot. But you're not to fellowship with the lost world. Love not the world. The other things in the world. Uh, be, you're not to be a friend of the world. You're not to conform to the world. You're to be sober and be vigilant. So Satan doesn't entice you and deceive you and get you back into the world. Romans 1.25 Who changes the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What is this talking about? Change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. They listen to man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. See, we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. It's talking about mankind. We're to uh, listen to God, not mankind, because mankind always comes back to saying, Yea, hath God said. We change the truth of God into a lie. And that's what they do. All these false religions, false converts, everything. Right? For 2 Timothy 1.13, what are we told to do? We're told to be sober, be vigilant, and we're to watch out for those who change God's word into a lie, and they worship men and the wisdom of men and the strength of men over God's strength and wisdom. But we're told in 2 Timothy 1st, chapter 1, verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God said we can take this land, let's go take it. Okay. He's greater than these people. Titus 1, 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to buy sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We have a perfect written word of God that we stand and hold to, and that's what we preach. And in these last days, a lot of people don't want to hear it. It's the hardest thing about being a Christian today because the world doesn't want to hear it. But by us preaching truth, there's still a few out there that do. I've seen people turn from these false gospels to the true gospel of Jesus Christ that's found in the King James Bible, the true plan of salvation. I've seen people turn from the Trinity and stick with the Godhead. I've seen people turn from post and mid-trib to stand for the Trinity, or sorry, sorry. the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Godhead over the Trinity, pre-time of Jacob's trouble over post and mid-trib. Okay? I've seen lost people who just hate God and reject God still get saved today. Okay, I've listened to testimony. It's still happening today. It's very few, far in between. And it's almost feeling like it's rare and rare every day. But it's still happening. We are convincing the gainsayers by sticking to the Word of God. Standing, standing, standing firm. Ephesians 6.11. What's the biggest thing we are commanded to do when it comes to withstanding this world when you get saved? We're to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Okay. One thing you understand, it's a spiritual battle. Okay, what's going on here? These people, these 12 spies, the other 11, are having a hard time trusting the Lord. That's spiritual. We need to trust the Lord. He will give us victory. They keep looking at the physical. These men are so strong, and they look at themselves physically, and we're weak compared to them. Okay. The enemies, what are they going to do, brothers and sisters in Christ? 
False converts in the lost world, they will try to find a weakness in you. They will question, question, question you. And we're going to see this as it goes on. They're going to question you. Just like these 11, it's almost like they're questioning Caleb. Uh, no, no, no. That's not true. What about this? What about that? These people are Amites. They're big. They're strong. This, that. Okay, as we're going to find out. Okay, they're going to question you, brother, sister, Christ. We're going to keep questioning you, questioning you, questioning you. And they don't really want answers. What they're looking for is for you to make a mistake. For them to find a question that you can't answer. And then that's where they go after you. Because you can't answer one question, everything else you teach is 100% false. That's their attitude. And why do they try to find a weakness in you? So they can feel strong. When they attack absolute truth, if they if you make a mistake or you have they have a question you can't answer, it makes them feel strong and wise and prideful and self-righteous. Okay. My advice to you is when they ask you a question you can't answer, write it down. I'll get back to you. I don't know, I, be honest. I don't know the answer to that one. I'll have to get back to you. Don't try to answer a question you don't know, okay? You're going to get a false report, and you're going to make more mistakes. If you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. Write the question down, do a Bible study, ask some truly Bible-believing, God-fearing men. Uh, you can look at some expository studies. Pray is the number one thing. Pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, help me to understand this question and help me to answer it. That's the number one thing you do. Remember, you always turn to Jesus Christ. Let me write it down and get back to you. Now, let's get to the other part that, that you're going to be attacked with. They keep saying well, that I teach sinless perfection. I don't. Okay. I believe, and I've proven it with my life, having to do an apology to the brethren, having to apologize for this. Uh, I, I fell into sin and temptation here. I made a mistake here. Uh, I don't teach that you're sinlessly perfect. I teach that your heart's desire is not wanting to sin against God. You don't want to sin against God. Okay? But they're going to attack your flesh with temptation and they're going to hold your sins against you. Okay? They'll claim we do that, but no, what we do is we look and say, okay, where's the changed life? What's your attitude towards sin? I don't hold their sin against them as far as, hey, a brother and sister in Christ falls into sin and temptation, they repent, they have sorrow for sinning, they have this heart desire, they don't want to sin, they get back to their relationship with the Lord. I have grace. You're supposed to have grace. But when you got people out there that defend sin, defend carnality, and just defend living like the world, looking like the world, acting like the world, I judge them spiritually saying, where's the heart's desire to not to sin against God? That God's perfect written word is absolute truth. He commands, I obey. Okay. So we're going to attack your flesh. One thing to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ and to convict you a little bit. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. The positive and the negative. You ready for it? The positive. You won't be tempted above that you are able. You will not be pounded into the ground with temptation where you can't, that God will not provide a way out. That's the positive. It's a great thing. Here's the negative. When you do fall into sin and temptation, what is this saying? It's your fault. Not God, not the world, your fault. That's the negative. That's the way it is. So I wanted to throw that out there first, that no matter what the lost world does, wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, you commit, if you fall into sin and temptation, you make an error, you're to come clean before God and before, before the brethren. I screwed up. Okay. The Bible says you're to confess your faults, not your specific sins, your faults one to another. Okay. I've seen people do this. They make a mistake and they try to downplay it by pointing the finger at other people. Well, I did this, but you did that. I did this, but you know, the enemies of the ministry... When you make a mistake, you just come out and say, I made a mistake. I screwed up. Okay? I was wrong. 
There's times where it's easy to let pride come in, and there's times where you want to fight because you get that, it's just a defense mechanism that comes up and someone finds out that you were wrong. You're ashamed of that wrong, and you're supposed to be when you, when you fall into sin and temptation, and they'll attack you and they'll try to hold it against you. Okay? 1 John 1 9, something else that's very positive, brothers and sisters of Christ, and it's encouraging for you. If we confess, remember, confession comes from the heart. You can say something, and it's not coming from the heart. You're just repeating what you read. You're parroting what someone else said. You're just saying something so you can be part of a certain group. You're saying something to deceive somebody. But confession comes from the heart. If we confess from the heart our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, people take that verse, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It says, out of the abundance. The mouth can still lie and deceive, but eventually the truth is going to come out. Okay? Confess with your heart, and God will forgive you. True godly sorrow, even in the life of a Christian, repent and repentance in the life of a Christian. You have to have godly sorrow. You have to have a desire not to sin against Him, and He will forgive you of your sin. Okay? Here's the thing. You come to Him and you ask Him to forgive you as a Christian. Luke 9.23 and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Okay? You deny yourself. You come to God with godly sorrow saying, I, My desire is to please you, Lord. I failed you. I've done it tons of times as a Christian. Lord, please forgive me. I screwed up. It was my fault. Nobody else to blame. Okay? Pick up your cross means you, you repent, you forsake what you did wrong, and you get back to serving the Lord. To so turn back to number 13, the two things they're going to attack you with is they're going to try to get you to doubt God's word, and they're going to get you to start relying on your own strength. Well, I'm falling into sin temptation. I can get it out of my life on my own. I had a rough time when I first got saved because I thought I could clean up my life on my own with my own strength. And the lost world is going to see when you make a, when you fail, they're going to start hammering you, and you're going to go back to your own. It's a the flesh is going to try to get you to go back to your own strength, and you're going to start trying to defend your sin when you need to turn back to God. Mm -hmm. So when you sin, you give a false, you get a bad report. Okay, you can give a bad report when you fall into sin, and when the lost world sees it, they're going to hold it against you. When the, uh, these false converts see it, they're going to hold it against you. Uh -huh. So the encouragement is, is, God will not allow you to be tempted above the year able. He'll forgive you if you come to Him with confessing from the heart, true sorrow. And He allows you to pick up where you left off. He puts the pieces, He picks you back up, puts the pieces back together, and lets you pick up where you left off. Okay? Number 13, verse 32. And what did those people, when Caleb said, we can do it, and the other 11 said, we can't, what, and the congregation is talking, you know, I, I, I want to believe they're trying to believe God at first, but what do these other 11 people do? Number 13, chapter 13, verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature and they were and, and there were saw the giants the son of Anak which come of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so we were in their sight I'm getting dramatic because I feel like that's how they were they're getting dramatic so my first question I have to ask with this is why did they not report this to Moses and Aaron in the congregation the first time? Why weren't they this dramatic the first time? They're putting on a show. They're doing whatever it takes to get them to doubt God's word, God's strength, and not go in there. Why did they make Caleb out to be a liar? Okay. The other led, why didn't the other 11 spies trust God? Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we see here, they're going to make us out to be liars. It's false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing. 
uh, even the lost world that reject Jesus Christ, they're going to try to make you out to be a liar. They're going to be dramatic. They're going to go overboard big time. Okay? That's why we're just to stick to the truth. Stick to the truth. We're not to act like them. We're not to be like the lost world. We're not to conform to the lost world. We're supposed to just preach absolute truth, stand for absolute truth, so we can gain, gain the gainsayers. Um, basically, the, lead people to Christ. Uh, brothers and sisters of Christ, they're falling away. We can lead them back to Jesus Christ and His perfect written word, saying, hey, you still have the Holy Spirit in you, you have Jesus in you, but you're falling. You need to come back uh, with your relationship and pick up where you left off. Repent, forsake, and move on. Okay? And they're going to come, and Satan's enemies, ministers of, uh, they transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, they're going to do everything they can to keep people from getting saved and to continue to mess up people that are. And that's what's going on here. They're messing up the people of Israel by putting on this big show, this big elaborate thing, you know, drama to convince them to turn against God, His Word, and rely on men's strength. We can't do it. 1 Corinthians 5, 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. We were reading this in First and Second Corinthians, how wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in, they're preaching another Jesus, they're, um, they're getting people to receive another spirit, and they're getting people to accept another gospel. And all the other gospels, all these false gospels out there, are all about the flesh. You can live however you want, you can be however you want, you can have this world and be a Christian. Okay? And what's going on? It gets bad. And as we're going to read here, the next part, it gets bad. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you. Remember the other 11 didn't say, well, Caleb's right. We trust the Lord. All 12 have the same report, same thing. We can do it. Let's go take them. We're supposed to be that way, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're supposed to all preach the same gospel, same major doctrines. We're supposed to stand for the King James Bible, be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. We're not to be adding to or subtracting from the Bible. We're not supposed to be Bible correctors. We're not supposed to be changing definitions in the Bible. Okay, we're supposed to speak the same thing, that there be no division among you. What's going on with the 12 spies? There's division. Mm -hmm. but, they, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. And the whole point of 1 Corinthians 5.1 about fornication is the fact that it says it is reported commonly. It's reported. Okay. Now, here we read here in 1 Corinthians 1.10, for it hath been declared unto me. He's hearing it from the lost world, from other people. Okay. What's going on there? The 11 spies are going out and telling them they can't do it. But the one person who's speaking truth, is uh, they won't listen to him, as we're going to find out. 1 Timothy 3.7 Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You have to have a good reproach of them who are without as well as within. We're supposed to have a good report between brothers and sisters in Christ. And according to God's word, hear me out, according to God's word, we're supposed to have a good report of the lost world. Now to the lost world, we're negative, we're bad, we're evil, we're wicked, we're foolish, we're crazy. I can keep going on. But when the lost world, I almost lost my place. But when the lost world looks at you and says, hey, that person's a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian man or woman, he doesn't go to movies anymore, Hollywood movies. That's a good report. They'll look down on you. They'll make fun of you. They'll do whatever they can to try to pull you back into the world. But that's a good report. He doesn't drink anymore, alcohol. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't do drugs, he doesn't do video games, porn. He doesn't dress like the world, she doesn't dress like the world. 
He wears a dress, a modest dress all the time with long, beautiful hair. Okay. You know, it just keeps going on and on. That's a good report from those that are without. It's not just about brothers and sisters in Christ having a good report. We have a good report between both. 2 Corinthians 6.1. So let's get back to this evil report. How does that apply to today, brothers and sisters of Christ? We then, as workers together with him, I think I said 2 Corinthians 6.1. So we're in 2 Corinthians 6.1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Remember what I said? We're, we're convincing the gainsayers. We're still, there's people out there that still can get saved. But today is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Remember, we're supposed to have a good report of them without as well as within. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, approving yourself, proving that you're a Christian, ministers of God, and much patience and afflictions and necessities and distress and stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fasting, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, it's evident, by love unfeigned, not fake. Remember they were putting on this big elaborate show and being all dramatic, how hard it is and how great the people is and everything. Verse 7, by the word of truth, that's what we have, brothers and sisters of Christ, by the power of God, you know what the power of God is? Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and true salvation. By the armor of righteousness, we talked about uh, put on the whole armor of God, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. You say, is that a contradiction? No, that's why I tried to explain it, brothers and sisters. We have, to us, and according to the word of God, and to brothers and sisters in Christ and to the Lord, it's a good report that we're getting from the lost world. But the lost world sees it as an evil report, and they're purposely trying to do an evil report of us to other lost people, to prevent them from getting saved to babes in Christ, newly saved, to confuse them. So it says here, by honor and dishonor. We are honored among the brethren and by the Lord, but we're dishonored by the lost world. By evil report and good report. Okay? As deceivers and yet true. These people over here are trying to deceive these. The 11 spies are trying to deceive them and saying, hey, we can't take it. We can't do it, and they make this all elaborate. I don't. I believe that it looks strong. Don't get me wrong. It looks a little bit difficult in order to take the land, but I don't think it was as overwhelmingly 100% impossible as they're trying to make it out when it comes to looking at the flesh. Mm -hmm. And yet, true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you and our heart is enlarged. Okay. We're doing an evil report and we're going to get evil reports of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, but you've got to stand fast to the Word of God. Keep the sanctification in your life going. Uh, be sober, be vigilant. Okay. So people are going to come to you like this and they're going to try to get you to turn on the Word of God. They're going to try to get you to indulge your flesh. Oh, sin isn't that big of a deal. Okay. Not trusting God's Word is not that big of a deal. Oh, you can be strong. You can have your own strength. You don't always have to rely on Jesus' strength. Turn back to Numbers 14. Number 14, or chapter 14, we're in the next chapter, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. World, is it worldly sorrow? I believe it's worldly sorrow. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Murmured behind their back. That's what's going to happen in life of a Christian. 
you're going to have people murmuring behind your back. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be, pray, be a prey, were it not better for us to return to, into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make captains, make a captain, and let us return to Egypt. Two things in that passage. They murmured against Moses, and it says, let us make captains. Make a captain. You know when they had Saul as king, they rejected God as their king. God said, Moses is the man I'm speaking through, and then they reject, and the one time where God says to Moses, they didn't, re oh no, that was still um, Samuel. They didn't reject you, but they rejected me as king. So they're not really rejecting Moses and Aaron, they're rejecting God. Okay. Second Peter 2 2. What is going on here? They're wanting to go back to Egypt. They're wanting to go back to the world. I don't believe personally with my studies and what I've talked to Christians and my experience, truly saved Christian, you're never ever gonna your desire in your heart is never gonna be I want to go back to the world. It's never gonna be I don't want to be a Christian anymore. If you're truly saved, it'll never be a desire in your heart to go back to the world. It'll never be a desire in your heart to resurrect the old man. You can be deceived, you can fall into temptation, and people can look at you and say, hey, that's what you used to do when you were lost. You're falling back into the things that the old man did. Okay? That's why we correct one another, we confess our faults one to another. But you will never, your heart's desire will never be to resurrect the old man go back out into this world. Okay. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 2 And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These false converts are showing their colors. The lost world they want to be good people but they go back to following their pernicious ways and the way of truth is evil spoken of. They were speaking, they murmured against Moses and Aaron. They are speaking evil of it. Okay. They are speaking truth. Caleb is speaking truth. We can take it. We can do it. Beloved love and spies are speaking lies. No, we can't take it. God's not strong enough. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, and be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, I believe there's a falling away of saved people, but what's that falling away, I believe? I believe, with what I've seen recently, two things can happen, okay? Two things you can, the uh, Bible talks about philosophy. I've seen people being spoiled by philosophy. And they're turning against the Word of God because they're spoiled by philosophy. Their desire is not to return to the world. Their desire is not to re resurrect the old man. But their um, philosophy, I'm trying to think of the word because my brain sometimes the word disappears. Spoiled. They're spoiled by philosophy. The other thing that comes in is the traditions of men. It comes in and it pulls people away and gets people to fall away. Because a lot of the traditions of men today, that's supposed to be Christianity, you won't find it in Scripture. You won't find it in the Bible. And most of the time it goes against Scripture. Uh -huh. There is a falling away today, brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't be part of the falling away. Be sober. Be vigilant. Stand for the Word of God. Keep putting the flesh down. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed their truth according to thy word. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. Time and time again, God has doors. He makes a way out. Continue to stand for the word of God. Stay in the word of God. Stay in prayer. Put in the flesh down. Don't let people get you to doubt God's word. Don't let people use your flesh as a get you to use your flesh as an occasion to sin. Okay. Well, it's not a big deal. All sin is negative. 
it's such a big deal that Jesus Christ had to die on the cross because of sin. It's the only way to save us. Numbers 14.5. What was Moses and Aaron's reaction? Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Tephunai. See, now Joshua's in here, the son of Nun, Caleb the son of Nephali. But up top, I remember now, up top it says the son of Nun. I want to go back up there for a second. So I don't want to go. It's just weird that they spell it differently. Because here, you have Joshua, J O S U U A. And then when you go to the, kind of windy out here. When you go up the top, it says Oshiah, the son of Nun. And then when you go down, Moses called Oshiah, the son of Nun, J-E-H-O-S-H-U-A. So yeah, I think when I went through this, I'm sorry, my brain just stuck. But Joshua was one of the 12. Okay, he's the son of Nun. This confirms it. But part of me wanted to know why it's spelled differently. Maybe one of you brothers and sisters in Christ can answer that. 2 Peter 2.2. Oh, I'm sorry. Where did I leave off? Oh, wait. Sorry. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. I got here, and that answered my question. So I'm sorry about that, brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, I'm not perfect. But I should say that. I'm wrong, brothers and sisters in Christ. I made this mistake. Search the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through is to search is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, they're relying on the Lord, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred to us. The defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now we see that Joshua as well as Caleb were for obeying the Lord and going into the land to possess it. They trust the Lord, His word, and they trust His strength, not their own. Remember it said we can overcome? Caleb said overcome. He didn't say we're stronger than them. He said we can overcome them. Okay. Genesis 18, 13. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I be of surety? bear a child with them old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Sometimes you got to ask yourself, am I relying on the Lord and trusting Him? Or am I falling into doubt? Um, doubting myself? Doubting God's word? Um, is, is anything too great for the Lord or too hard for the Lord? We're going to go back to Philippians 4.13. When you start to doubt and you start to turn from God's word, the flesh starts to take over. Why is that? Okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We talked about are your leaves withering? The study we did together on are your leaves withering, the, pe the company you fellowship with and putting down the Word of God will affect what we're talking about here. You turning on God's Word, you giving back into the flesh. So, for this whole study, was out of the 12 spies, only two people were courageous, the other 10 were foolish. So Joshua and Caleb were courageous, the other ten were foolish. Here's the question I have to ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you going to be courageous and let God's word and strength be your foundation? Or are you going to be foolish and follow the words and strength of men? So that's what I'd ask you guys. That's the courageous man, foolish man. But I wanted to add a part to it. Numbers 14, 10. Go back to Numbers 14. We're going to read verse 10. But all the congregation bade, bade stone them with stones. You know, there's a lot of people out there, the false converts, the lost Christ rejecting world, want to uh, stone us with stones. 
And the, what happened? And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. God had intervened. How does that apply to today, brothers and sisters in Christ? More, more exactly, how is that going to apply in the future? Okay. Right now, people, we have people who believe in Jesus Christ, Aaron and Moses standing for the word of Jesus Christ and his strength, Caleb and Joshua doing the same. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're still going to have to appear before the Lord. The Lord appeared before everybody, the whole congregation. The Lord's going to set things straight. The saved are going to set, uh, appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the lost, where are they going to appear before Jesus Christ? Eleven, Revelation 20, 11, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was not found no place for him. And the people were judged. Okay, that's why we call it the great white throne judgment because it says great white throne here and then the next verse says that the people are bringing, being brought forth to be judged, the lost world. God, uh, God shows up in His glory. And the glory of the Lord appeared, what it says. Remember, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, for then every one of them shall give an account of himself to God. You don't have to give an account of yourself, brother and sister of Christ. You need to stand, stand, stand. Be courageous, okay? Make sure that God's word and God's strength is your foundation. You're not relying on your own strength. You're not falling in the trap or you're not sober. You're not vigilant, okay? So, be courageous. Don't be foolish, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for watching.